Uh, so Lorcan Price is an Irish barrister at law and um, is ADF International's legal counsel in Strasbourg, France, where he ad advocates for ADF clients at the Uni European Court of Human Rights and the Council of Europe. Lorcan is a graduate of the National University of Ireland, Trinity College Dublin, and the University of Oxford. His talk is entitled Misinformation, Disinformation, and Hate Speech. The floor is yours. Uh, the laptop has frozen, I'm told. Yes. Technical difficulties. Misinformation and disinformation. Well, I, I, in any event, until we solve that, I'll, I'll begin. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for that kind introduction, Ellen. Thank you to the conference organizers and uh, esteemed fellow panelists, ladies and gentlemen. It's a, a real pleasure to talk to you here. Uh, I think I'm the only person perhaps in the panel uh, who doesn't hold uh, an academic appointment or an ecclesiastical office. Uh, so it's a pleasure for a humble lawyer uh, to address you. Now, perhaps those who know me would say that the humble lawyer reference is perhaps the first piece of misinformation uh, or disinformation you're going to hear, and I'll try and limit it at that. Um, so uh, in the absence of slides, I'll, I'll continue the old-fashioned way. Um, this session is titled A Century of Persuasion, and uh, what we, how we engage in persuasion now is essentially done with technology, and it's the technology that we use to communicate that, uh, and how that is being regulated that will form part of this discussion. Um, well, <laughs> okay, I, I want to situate that as well, of course, within um, uh, what we have uh, from uh, St. John Paul II, uh, when he talked about, uh, or when he wrote, rather, to those engaged in mass communication, uh, about the need uh, to, and I can read you the slide uh, because it's obviously difficult to talk about this in the absence of seeing it, uh, in his apo apostolic letter to those responsible for communications in 2005, uh, St. John Paul II said, man's genius has, with God's help, produced marvelous technical inventions uh, from creation, especially in our times. The church, our mother, is particularly interested in those which directly touch man's spirit and which have opened up all which have opened up new avenues of easy communication and all kinds of news, ideas, and orientations. Um, he goes on to say in the same apostolic letter, communication permeates the essential dimensions of the church, which is called to announce to all the joyful message of salvation. For this reason, the church takes advantages of the opportunities offered by communications media as pathways providentially given by God to intensify communication and to render more penetrating the proclamation of his word. So when uh, my generation, as it were, communicates, uh, we communicate, uh, I think we all do now, essentially, really, uh, online, and we do so using, I think, what Professor Legutko referred to as the Promethean fire of technology, which is, allows us to amplify our voices to millions of people. Uh, and the consequences of that are one thing that policymakers are grappling with. And that's why I want to talk about where the European Court of Human Rights has stepped into the, this discussion uh, in the, uh, on the freedom of expression issue, but also on the regulation of what is described, uh, unfortunately, as hate speech. So the, um, it, it's interesting listening to some of the presentations yesterday. Ah, very good, okay. We're back in business, great. So, well, I've read that and that. Ah, so here we are, the European Court of Human Rights, a strikingly ugly building, um, uh, which unfortunately I have to see quite regularly as I live quite close to it, and I practiced before it. Um, but uh, Article 10 of the Convention, uh, as you'll see, protects freedom of expression. Uh, Article 10, one, clearly uh, gives this right, um, uh, it's the right to hold opinions and to communicate them, and then the second part of Article 10, uh, as, as we see with the other articles in the Convention 8, 9, 10, and 11, places restrictions on that um, and allows it to pr those prescriptions once are re prescribed by law and are necessary um, to, to take effect. So when we talk about the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights um, and how it has evolved uh, over the years, I think it's uh, important to really situate that uh, in, in the context of this case, um, which is the leading case from the court um, and is, is often cited in the context of uh, freedom of expression. 
and this is the case of Handyside in the United Kingdom, decided in 1976. And this case arose in the context of a book called The Little Red Book, which was published by a Danish company, uh, which contained essentially sexually explicit imagery and was aimed at children. Um, and uh, the court decided uh, that what was necessary in a democratic society was the communication of views that shock, disturb, uh, or offend. And the court placed this within uh, the requirements of democracy, which I think is quite interesting. The, the, the demands of pluralism, tolerance, and broad-mindedness, without which would there be no democratic society. So the court's saying essentially there that uh, uh, all of the members of the Council of Europe, all 40, well, 46 member states now at the departure of Russia, are democracies, and that it is necessary for the functioning of those democracies for uh, ideas that some might find shocking, disturbing, or offensive to be communicated. Um, so what's happened in, in the meantime? Uh, interestingly, it, it, the, the real, uh, as many of you will be aware, the changes happened in the academic discourse in the 80s and the 90s, particularly in various liberal bastions in, in US academia, where increasingly some became convinced that speech was actually a weapon in the hands of the powerful to continue the victimization of marginalized people and groups. Uh, these commentators uh, likened the alleged misuse of unregulated speech to weapons, and there was a particularly influential book in that regard called Words That Wound that was published in 1993, uh, a collection of essays. So uh, offensive speech, rather than being something that it was necessary to tolerate uh, in the name of democracy, in fact became a lethal threat to the weakest members of the demos, and so-called hate propaganda was deemed to be the ideological means by which the powerful uh, silence and dominate historically disenfranchised people. And so hate speech, they're, they're arguing, has enormous social consequences, uh, you know, perpetuating uh, stereotypes, uh, discrimination, and in fact, hampers participation in democracy. So the very opposite of what uh, the court was, was describing as a necessity open speech, even though th that speech that is offensive becomes a threat to democracy uh, with the, this evolving view. So this, the court was not immune to these changes. And in fact, um, uh, we could actually see in real time over the course of uh, 2015 to uh, 2019 in, in a series of cases taken by an anti uh, or pro-life activist called uh, Klaus Annan in Germany. He lives near Frankfurt and he picketed abortion clinics in Frankfurt. And his, uh, he was, he was, uh, there was a criminal injunction brought against him in February 2016. He was distributing pamphlets uh, describing uh, the doctor's involvement in abortion as being tantamount to uh, the crimes of the Holocaust. And the European Court of Human Rights said that the leaflets and the statements were part of a public debate of public interest. So even though they were controversial, it was necessary to allow them to be expressed, again, reminding us that there is a democratic requirement to have these views ventilated in society. By December uh, 2018, January 2019, the same uh, applicant as before the court uh, he had a whole series of cases brought one after the other, um, and he filed them at different times, so they weren't able to consolidate them as such. The court took the opposite view. It, it held, as you see there, that uh, in, in Germany, uh, that because of the, the horrors of, of the Nazi regime, it's not proper to compare uh, various biotechnological abuses um, to the experiments carried out in human, on humans in, in concentration camps. And uh, they decided ultimately that because, even though the sanction against Mr. Annan was criminal in nature, it was at the lower end of uh, the type of sanctions that they could impose. So his speech was criminalized, um, and on precisely the same basis, uh, or, or using really this, the same materials he had used in 2016, they changed their position uh, by 2018, 2019. So it, it begs the question, uh, or rather raises the question, uh, what has changed in the meantime? Um, my view is that uh, three important events happened uh, during that period. One was the uh, refugee crisis in Europe in 2015. The other was the Brexit uh, referendum in 2016. And the third was the election of Donald Trump. And is the court operating in a bubble? It's certainly not. And this had an enormous impact. Those three events, rather, had an enormous impact on the thinking at the Council of Europe. Um, I was there during this period, and what struck me was that, uh, particularly after Brexit, uh, various members of staff, senior court registers, 
uh, registrars, um, uh, registry lawyers, other advisors, were all wearing lanyards with no hate speech uh, written on them. They were festooned with badges. Uh, you can see an example of that there, of the no hate speech movement. And so the, the language of hate speech and the threat that it posed to democracy was uh, suddenly very evident uh, in the institutions of the Council of Europe, both the court, the parliamentary assembly, and the uh, committee of ministers. And uh, that raises another question, a quite an obvious one. What is hate speech? What is this specter that's haunting the democracies of Europe that they're so particularly concerned about that requires uh, uh, people who are pro-life activists to have criminal sanctions upheld against them? And you, you can see there that um, this is something I took from a, 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 a little piece from the media guide of the Council of Europe, um, but it is, it's reflected in the decisions that I'm going to mention in a moment from the European Court of Human Rights, that there's no settled view on, on what constitutes hate speech. And some people see this as well, it's an example that this is an evolving area and uh, there's a concern about being too precise about this in order to deal with the threats. I disagree, I, th I think the vagueness isn't uh, a quirk of this area. I think it is an intentional design feature. It's designed to have everybody from uh, Christian uh, 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 preachers in, in the streets of various European cities to pro-life activists constantly looking over their shoulders and wondering, uh, am I engaged in speech that will give rise to criminal prosecution? Will I be able to rely on Article 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights? And uh, I think there's a real concern, uh, as I showed, that you won't. Um, here's a selection of more cases that have been decided since the, 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 the shock of uh, the three events that I mentioned to you. Um, uh, Lindendal and, and Iceland, uh, in this particular case, a gentleman went on the radio in Iceland and he suggested that uh, homosexuality was degenerate. Uh, he was prosecuted under Icelandic law for hate speech. He appealed ultimately after exhausting his domestic remedies to the court in Strasbourg, and they held uh, that Article 10 was not engaged. Uh, ES in Austria, this is a well-known um, public figure in Austria who commented on uh, the relationship that's in, in, in the historical record between uh, Muhammad and his, uh, he married uh, Asia, who was eight years old. He suggested that might be pedophilic. Uh, she was prosecuted under the uh, Austrian equivalent of hate speech, and ultimately uh, the court found that um, even though during the speech that, uh, um, well, her name is well known, Elizabeth Shabat Wolf, gave, um, even though that there was a historical discussion about the nature of Islam, to pack in an insulting, or to place an insulting reference packed in with other historical uh, analysis was insufficient to engage any of the protections uh, in the case law around Article 10. And to, then to counterpoint all this, and this is where I think the, the, the ultimately the, the real problems with the application of this comes, uh, is the um, Ekelehena case, uh, Russia. This is a, a well-known Russian uh, rock group with a very insulting name that I'm not going to use here. They invaded the altar sanctuary of Christ the Savior Cathedral in Moscow. Um, they were ultimately prosecuted for a number of offences. One of them was the Russian equivalent of hate speech because the attack was on the uh, hierarchy of the Russian Orthodox Church. And um, the court found that their Article 10 rights had been breached. Um, and the reason was that the punishment was disproportionate. Um, so the citations are there. You can read those cases. You can draw your own conclusions, I think, um, from, from the, the, the counterpoint. Uh, so... The court's jurisprudence on hate speech, I would suggest to you, is uh, incoherent, and uh, it has been triggered by, largely, I would suggest, a political uh, reaction to events that are ongoing in Europe. Um, but it's not just the European Court of Human Rights that's on the hate speech bandwagon. Uh, far more dangerously, uh, we have the European Commission. And this is where it, it really becomes a problem uh, for countries, particularly in Eastern Europe, that do not have uh, strong hate speech laws, or the ones at least that they're not using uh, to prosecute. Um, the European Union now, the Commission rather, proposes to expand the list of EU crimes under Article 83 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the Union to include hate speech. So what, what are EU crimes, you might ask? Um, they are, at the moment, uh, terrorism, trafficking in human beings, sexual exploitation of women and children, illicit drug trafficking, arms trafficking, Mundilon, 
during corruption, counterfeiting, uh, computer crimes, organized crime, and soon hate speech if the proposal is not vetoed uh, by the, uh, well, it requires actually unanimity under Article 83 of the TEFU. So if there's any senior Polish government officials in the audience, uh, Poland can and should veto this particular proposal. So um, the, the, the difficulty, of course, with the EU becoming involved uh, into this is that what it will lead to, uh, and it's quite clear that the purposes of, of Article 83 in relation to those other serious kind of crimes, is to promote coordination in terms of standards and prosecutions across the territory of the European Union. So when we talk about what kind of coordination they might have in mind, uh, I would uh, put it to you and I would submit to you, and I think perhaps you might uh, see where I'm going with this and agree, that it's a coordination towards the lowest possible bar to allow a prosecution and to criminalize speech. And uh, there is some evidence already for this because the European Union is uh, engaged in uh, a non-binding uh, code of conduct which requires uh, ever more censorship online to remove uh, so-called hate speech. And so the European Union has been active in this before its recent proposal, it's a, the 2019 proposal, um, or forgive me, 2020 proposal for the Commission for Hate Speech to be a, a Euro crime, they've already been engaged in significant efforts to try and remove online hate speech. Again, this came in in 2016, and uh, the context for this was uh, the, the, the events I mentioned earlier, Trump, Brexit, and the, the, the rise of the right, as it was described, in the aftermath of the crisis in 2015. Um, the companies, of course, are very happy to cooperate with this, um, uh, and uh, th there's fascinating academic discussion about the extent to which already well-established uh, large companies will agree and cooperate with new regulation to be brought in because they are best placed uh, already having the resources to frame that regulation and then to implement it, and it acts as an effective bar then to new entrants into the market, uh, new social media companies, because of the regulatory burden that would be immediately put on them early on to comply with the regulation. So it, you won't be surprised to hear that um, the uh, various companies there, um, they've all gone rainbow for Pride, what was Pride Day and then became Pride Week and is now Pride Month. Uh, very soon it will be Pride Year and then Pride Decade and so on. So it's, uh, it's something that the companies are actively cooperating with. So we can expect to see more speech being removed from uh, the internet. Um, I'm going to flick through the next few slides because they're quite specific on the United Kingdom. Uh, but the, the even countries that have left the European Union are not immune from the, the problems associated with uh, having hate crime and hate speech in their laws. Um, the, the, I think this tweet is particularly interesting. It's against from Glasgow Police. So before you post something, ask yourself, is it true? Is it hurtful? Is it illegal? Is it necessary? Is it kind? Or you might be receiving a visit from the police. Now, I think if, if I was to look back through my Facebook posts, under that particular rubric, I would be removing a lot of things uh, that aren't necessary to begin with, um, pr probably aren't true, and I won't address the rest of them. But uh, in the United Kingdom as well, so even, even a country that has left the European Union, there is a very serious problem still with uh, hate speech uh, regulation. So wh wh where does this crystallize into an example of um, what happens when you uh, find yourself at the receiving end of these hate speech laws um, that are now going to be coordinated and, and across Europe? Um, you can't rely on Article 10 to give you a, a robust defense, but uh, Pivy Rasman, MP, who uh, is pictured behind me, uh, is somebody I've had the pleasure to be part of her legal team. She's a Finnish MP who uh, was prosecuted last year for hate speech for posting this on Twitter, which is a extract from uh, Romans 11, St. Paul's letter to the Romans, where a, she essentially directs her remarks in Finnish at the Finnish evangelical, evangelical Lutheran Church who had decided to use church funds to sponsor the Helsinki Pride Parade. And she, being a member of that church, asked the question, how can we exalt pride when it is, in fact, a sin? And for that, uh, a criminal complaint was made to the Helsinki police who uh, uh, didn't arrest her but uh, told her to attend the police station under caution. She was subjected to 10 hours of police interrogation uh, for posting this and for suggesting that um, 
pride and uh, sin uh, were offensive to the homosexual community in Helsinki. And uh, we have just completed, uh, well, we completed earlier in the year, a two-day trial before the Helsinki District Criminal Court where um, ultimately we were victorious. But the absurdity of, in, in a modern European country, uh, watching a public figure, a Christian, being cross-examined over what constitutes sin on the basis of something she put on social media uh, was uh, manifest to me and, and I think ought to remind all of us in this room uh, that uh, increasingly in Europe at least, um, that this is what we're looking at as the coordination and the lowering of the bar of prosecutions in this area continues apace. So um, this is uh, a meme, as we say, uh, that uh, I like to send to some friends of mine who are liberals. Uh, it shows the difference between where we were in the first picture is uh, in the 1960s. Famously, Berkeley in the University of California, Berkeley was a center of the free speech movement uh, in the United States at that point. Um, below is another picture from Berkeley uh, in 2019 where uh, they attempted to organize a free speech march and, well, you can see that the anarchists and Antifa, well, it's clear what they think of free speech. So we're talking in the context of this uh, session about uh, the censure of persuasion and communicating, uh, as I say, in the manner that uh, St. John Paul II suggested in his apostolic letter to those engaged in mass communications. And he makes the point that the great challenge of our time for believers and for all people of goodwill is to maintain truthful and free communication, which will help consolidate progress around the world. And the question we must ask ourselves is, will we be able to engage in truthful and free communication where hate speech laws are increasingly used to punish any expression of uh, that some may find offensive, shocking, or disturbing. Uh, and of course, I should end really with a, a quote from a, a Polish uh, philosopher, um, Ko Kowalski, Ko <laughs> Leszlek Ko Kowalski, sorry. Uh, Kolokowski, thank you very much, uh, Judge. Um, he made the point that the, the, the natural law of despotism is moral inflation. The distributor of goods, the despot, demands ever higher prices if social pressures do not oblige them, do not oblige him to cut them. We are being demanded, there's a type of inflation going on at the moment where we're demanded to clap men competing in women's sports, where we're demanded to doff the cap to pride parades, where we're, it's demanded that rainbow flags are increasingly required for those of us working in large organizations to be worn on lanyards or buttons. These demands, this inflationary demand, won't end until such time as we are able to in stand by the freedom of expression that we have protected in international human rights law, make it clear what it actually means, going back to the 1976 expression in the Handyside case. Um, and without the ability to articulate the truth, then the century of persuasion that John Paul II spoke about will be denied to us as well. Thank you very much. Thank you.